Good morning. Good morning. Make sure you're good here. Okay. Sometimes I don't know if we're actually on or not because I didn't see the light, but I'm seeing the light now, so it's all good. <laughs> okay, for the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about purpose, passion, and vision. The three things required to help a church survive and thrive. Well, the last, the last couple of weeks actually has been about purpose and passion. So today we're going to talk about vision. And as we talk about vision, I'm just going to, I'm just going to share with you, this has been one of the hardest lessons that I've ever had to prepare for a various uh, number of reasons. But it's just kind of, it's kind of hard to wrangle. It's just kind of hard to, to pull in the idea of vision because vision means so many different things to so many different people. And so as we look at, at what vision is, of course, we're not talking about the ability to see. You know, that's what we know our physical vision is. What it, we're talking about the, what is described as the unusual discernment or foresight. That's how it was described as in, I think, the, the third definition that, that Webster used was, was that one. Unusual discernment or foresight. And so then a, a visionary then could be described as someone who possesses unusual discernment or foresight. And so I got to thinking about people from the past who we would consider visionaries. Um, people like Andrew Carnegie. You know, he, he was a clerk. He was a clerk and he began to recognize some trends. And so he started buying up small amounts of stock in various companies. And he became one of the captains of industry in creating U.S. Steel. And was at one time the wealthiest man on the planet. Because he had the foresight to see what was, what was happening. Anybody heard, heard of James Glazier? Anybody know James Glazier? Okay, he was a meteorologist back in the late 19th century. He used hot air balloons to, to reach heights that had before not been reached. And he had the foresight to, to, to determine how to, to measure temperature and, and uh, barometric pressure. And, and he was one of the forerunners of modern meteorology. But he, he was a brilliant mind. He was ridiculed by his, his colleagues. But come to find out, he was a very forward-thinking individual. How about Preston Tucker? Anybody familiar with Preston Tucker? Yeah, the Tucker Torpedo, the four, Tucker 48. Way ahead of his time. In rack and pinion steering, four-wheel four suspension, disc brakes, all these things that no other car has had that now every car has. Tucker had those in 48, way ahead of the other car makers. I mean, you go back to Henry Ford, a visionary. He could see where things were going. But what about Norman Shumway? Anybody familiar with Norman Shumway? Okay, back in 1958, Norman Shumway was a doctor in Houston and he performed the very first successful heart transplant. Now the name Christian Barnard, you not know that name? He's the man who goes down in history as performing the first successful heart transplant because he did that on December 3rd, 1967 in South Africa because that was on a human. Norman Shumway did it on a dog. But he had the vision and the foresight to know that, hey, I believe we can do this. I believe we can take one heart from something else and, and put it in this person or this animal and it may work. Well, I'm going to try it on a dog and it worked. And then you can name people all down through history that we consider to be visionaries. What is the one thing, well, they had many things in common, but one thing that I want to talk about they have in common is that they weren't satisfied with the way things are. 
They just weren't going to be happy with the status quo. Like Thomas Edison had over 3,000 failures before he created the light bulb. 3,000. How many of us would have the perseverance to, to try 3,000 times? Do you know where WD-40 got its name? 40 attempts at creating a water displacement element. Creating a, a, a material that would be, you could use as water displacement and it wouldn't affect other things. On the 40th attempt, he got it right. So it's water displacement 40. 40th try. Well, that's about three. I just said, you know what? Somebody smarter than me is going to do this. I'm just going to give up. But these people we talk about being visionaries, not satisfied to say, well, this is just the way things are and we're going to be okay with that because that's just where we are. And so how does the church become visionary how does the church have vision that takes us to somewhere where we're not, but still maintain our commitment to truth and our understanding of the sovereignty of God? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we envision where we can go and yet still maintain truth? I want to look at a couple of visionaries that we have here. We have uh, examples of, you yeah, know, we have uh, in Genesis chapter 10, I don't know if you all are familiar with this or not, but I, when I was growing up, people that used this term when meant you were you were a foolish or not making any sense when they called you a nimrod. Anybody ever been called a nimrod? I have. Well, look at what look at what Genesis ten says about Nimrod, beginning in verse eight. Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kauna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ur, and Cala, and reason between Nineveh and Cala, that is the principal city. Here's a man whose name now is, is synonymous with foolish or not make any sense or whatever. And yet he was the mighty hunter before God and he built kingdoms. He built these, these kingdom cities and he built the city of Nineveh, which was a, a, a powerful and influential city that we read about a little bit later on, of course. But Nimrod was a visionary. He wasn't satisfied just, just being the way things are. You know, it's just he could, he could look ahead and see there's got to be something better. Over in Genesis chapter 30, we have Jacob. Y'all, Jacob is, knows it's time for him to leave. And so he's thinking, I'm gonna, I am going to provide for myself some flocks. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to make some plans and I'm going to create a situation to where I leave, when I leave here, I'm going to be a wealthy man. And so if you're familiar with the story, he made a deal with Laban and as it worked out, he put some, put some shredded bark by the feed and he, and, and he separated out sheep. And, you know, and he created for himself these speckled and striped animals that he could take with him. So he he's, he's a, has the foresight to look and say, I'm going to do something better than what I have right now. Perhaps one of the most famous individuals we look at that has foresight was, was Joseph. In Genesis 41, you know, Joseph, is, uh, Pharaoh's having these dreams and he can't decide what they're all about. So, so Joseph comes in and he, and he shares with Pharaoh what's going to be happening for seven years. There's going to be plenty. And then for seven years, there's going to be nothing. And so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of making plans for that. And they build store cities where for seven years they collect grain and they, they harvest as much as they can and they put it in these cities for storage. And then, you know, then on top of that, not only does Joseph have the foresight to prepare 
for these seven lean years. During the seven lean years, you know, I, this just, I read it and I think, well, that's kind of rude. But he makes the people of Egypt come and buy the food until they run out of money. He says, okay, well, then I'll take your livestock. And so they give them all the livestock. They run out of food again. He says, okay, I'm going to take your land. And then he takes their land in payment for the food. And then they have nothing left to give. And so they say, we're going to give ourselves to the king as his slaves just to give us something to eat. And so it says that Joseph created a situation where now the entire land of Egypt belongs to Pharaoh, including the people. You know, somebody with no foresight would have said, what are we going to do? We're going to eat good for seven years, but then we're liable to starve. He took somebody with some foresight, with some, some discernment to have that vision of what needs to happen next. And so this is why, this is why I, I, I think about this lesson about vision and I, and I have such a difficult time. Because each one of us has a different vision. Now, they can all be very similar. And some of them might be almost exact. But we, each one of us has a different vision of what we expect, what we, what we want, what, what our goal is. So what is, what is your vision? <clears throat> Just answer this for yourself. What is your vision when you think about Sunday mornings at Camelback. Just, just think about that for a moment. What is your vision? And, and as you think about it, think about, am I, am I satisfied with, with this? I mean, is my vision for what we are as a church body? Is, that, is my vision, is, is what we are in my, in my vision, are they the same? <clears throat> am I, have I in my mind just accepted this is who we are, this is where we are, this is what we are, and I'm perfectly fine with that. And we talked about that a little bit in class this morning. How it is so easy to get into the, to the, the, the mechanical motion of walking through these doors and coming in here and sitting down for the hour or so that we're here and then mechanically getting up and walking out. Is that our vision for our, our relationship with God? Is that, our, is that the vision that when we were baptized into Christ, for those of us who have been baptized into Christ, is that, was that our vision when we put on Christ? That we would just become mechanical and wrote about, our, about our, the method of our worship? Then I'm just going to come in, I'm going to, I'm going to trudge in and sit down. I'm going to stand up and trudge out. Y'all, that, is, is that the vision that we started this journey with? Because many of us have been on this journey for a long time. Many of us have been on this walk, in this walk, in this relationship with God for many, many years. Is this the vision that we started with? This is how I want my, this is how I want my Christianity defined by the number of times I walk through the door and the number of hours I sit in a pew. Is that, is that the vision we have of, of our worship? Is that the, the vision we have of what our relationship with God is? You know, I may have shared this with you before, but Minnie Pearl one time, she's, she's a, a great philosopher. And for those of you who didn't get to, to be around her very much or hear her very much, you missed out. But she, she was talking about marriage. And she said, marriage is a whole lot like a hot bath. Once you've been in it for a while, it ain't so hot. <laughs> now, I think about that sometimes when I think about our Christian life. You know, we, we, we get started and we have this idea of what our, our faith is going to be. It's going to grow. We're going to do all these wonderful things. And, and our life is going to be fulfilled. And we're going to be on fire for God. And, we, and, and then eventually it, we just... Settle in to the routine. Y'all, I'm going to tell you again and again and again and again, Jesus Christ did not come to this earth and down the cross so that we could live ordinary lives. 
He came to earth and died so that we could live extraordinary lives. He came to earth so that he could give us abundant life. And so when we settle in to just, this, well, this is what we do, we are not taking full advantage of the blood of Jesus. He didn't die so that we can just do what we do. He didn't walk out of the grave so that we can just maintain the status quo. So our vision, our, our, our vision individually, our vision collectively, what are we going to do with our future at Camelback? I mean, as we look around us, we say, this is not where we want to be. I mean, this is not the circumstances we want to be in. I would like to have people standing in the back looking for a place to sit. I, and not because I think, man, look at how many people I brought in. Because that, that would be the number of souls that are being affected by the Word of God. And we need more souls to be affected by the Word of God. Amen. And so as we look at this, look around us, is this the vision that we have for Camelback? Is this the vision that we have for the church at large? Because I'm just going to be really, really blunt right here, okay? This is going to be hurtful to some of us. It hurts me. But if we don't do something... My vision of this place in a few years is condominiums. I'm just going to tell you the truth. If we don't create some vision, if we don't create some foresight, then one of these days we're going to be a location where some developer has come in and raised this building and built luxury condominiums. And y'all, I'm going to tell you, that hurts my heart. That's the vision if we don't do something. Now, I, I, and I say that, y'all, I, I don't say that. I'm not saying that if y'all don't do something. I say if we don't do something, if we don't recognize that we have purpose and that we address that purpose with passion and that we hone that all together, pull it all together into a vision for the future of this congregation and the future of the Lord's church here at Camelback, then what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? What do we expect to change if we, Christians, if we don't affect that change? What do we, what do we hope to accomplish? I mean, we're providing a, a nice, comfortable place to worship. We're providing a, a nice worship experience. We're, we're providing, you know, fellowship for, the, for those who choose to be a part of it. But are we, just, are we just maintaining what we're doing? Are we, are we going through? Now, I'm, I'm not judging your heart. I, I'm not going to do that. I don't know your heart. But I can see as a group how our hearts are manifest. And we right now, y'all, are, are maintaining who we are. Do we have the vision to look ahead and say, this is not where we want to be? I'm not talking about physically where we want to be. This, this circumstance is not where we want to be. We want to be a growing, thriving church that is unified and, and loving and committed and excited and passionate about Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, it, it frightens me. And not just for not just for Camelback, but for many congregations around the country, that there the vision is, well, we had a worship service this Sunday. We're going to have one next Sunday too. And then we'll have one the next Sunday after that. And then we'll have one the next Sunday. That is the vision for many churches these days, for many congregations. We're just going to simply hold our service on Sunday morning and do it again next week. And I look at the, the, the effect the early church had on Jerusalem and the surrounding area. You know, if you read the account, if you read the first few chapters of Acts, there, there was no satisfied with the status quo. There was no just, I'm happy where I am and I'm not going to leave it right there. 
You know, when, when the Holy Spirit came down and, and into that room where everybody was and it set on them like tongues of fire and, you know, it had been very easy to say, oh, this is great. There's about 120 of us in here and, and we're just going to, we're going to just keep this 120 and, and we're perfectly happy right here meeting in this room and everything is wonderful and we're just so glad to be here together. That's not, that's not what happened. Now they went out and they proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody who would listen, even to the point of death. Because their vision was not that we're just going to do what we're doing right here. Their vision was, y'all, we have something so magnificent in Jesus Christ. We can't help but share that. We have got to get the word out. We're not going to be satisfied, just 120 of us right here. And before you knew it, there were 3,000 souls added to the church that day and, and more added daily as God added them. So this is why the, this is why the, the, the vision talk is so hard. Because I, I can't... I can't create your vision any more than I can create your passion. I can't create in you. I, 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 can't, I can't take you and, and say, this is what you're going to envision. As, you know, if I, when, my, when my kids were little, I could say, this is what you're going to do. And they did it. You know, we can't do that now. I, I can't come here. I, I can't unscrew the top of your head and put vision in there and, and screw it back on and say, now you're good to go. I have a hard enough time with my own vision. Trying to maintain focus on what's really important and where we need to go as a church body and what we need to do to establish the fact in the world and let the world see in us that we are not normal. Okay? We are not normal. We are born again. We are born twice. We are now redeemed and washed daily by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a hope that's not on this earth, but in heaven. We have a Savior that gave His life for us. You know, that is, that is, that is not normal for a lot of folks. They don't understand that. But if we look at what Jesus has done for us and what we have now waiting for us, why can we not envision something greater? Y'all, yeah, I want to I I read something to you right quick here because this is, this is pretty good stuff. Well, it's all good stuff, but this is nice. Revelation chapter 4. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within. And they did not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And this whole account continues to go on. And even down in chapter 5, it, it talks about this, this scene in the throne room of heaven. And in verse 8 of chapter 5, it says, Now when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
Did you get that last part? Listen, church, our prayers are in the throne room of heaven. Can you imagine this worship scene? Can you imagine a, a, a worship where we're actually in the presence of God? Church, I got news for you. We are in the presence of God. How long has it been since you shouted, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty? I can't tell you the last time I did that. I can't tell you if I've ever done that. Except in a setting like this. But can you envision this scene in heaven knowing that this is the God we serve? This is what He's provided for us. This, this opportunity to spend eternity around His throne. Can you see that ahead of you? Can you envision that scene and you actually being a part of that moment? It's an amazing thing to think about. Folks, we, we can have we can have meaningful, powerful worship. We're, we're not, where we're not gathered around a throne shouting. We can do that. We can. But folks, we need to realize that God has provided for us an amazing opportunity to be in His presence. And that our worship to Him should be with purpose and it should be with passion and it should be with vision. And not just as we gather together to worship, but every day we spend needs to be with purpose and a passion and a vision of the sovereignty and the power in the majesty of God. So I, I, I want to how do we do it, folks? How do we do it? How do we create? How do we how do how do we create this passion? How do we present ourselves as visionaries when it comes to, to our worship to God? Committing to Him, submitting to Him? I mean, we, we, we've got to go from, from sedentary to visionary. We've got to go from stationary to visionary. Have you ever seen, you ever seen sedimentary rock? You ever, ever seen sedimentary? You, uh, you can look at it and you see there are the levels. There, there are different layers of rock. And you know how that's formed? It's because things that are floating and moving around, they eventually settle into one spot and never move again. And then they become a rock. You know, we can't allow ourselves to become sedimentary. We can't allow ourselves to become, become stationary. We can't allow ourselves to become apathetic. We can't even, we can't even allow ourselves to simply become reactionary. Because reactionary means we don't do anything until we're absolutely forced to by some outside force. Visionary, church. Visionary. Can we create the approach of being visionaries in our worship to God and our commitment to Him? If you're going to do that, then that is your decision and your commitment. I can't make you. I can encourage you. And folks, I guarantee you can encourage me. But Jesus Christ came to this earth and gave His life so that we can spend eternity with Him and the Father. That to me, church, is a beautiful vision. I want you to be a part of that. You need to, won't you come as we stand and sing?